The following is an Operation Podcast production. Oh, New Year's resolutions and goal setting. And, you know, New Year's resolutions irk me. And one of the reasons is I believe they just set you up to fail, right? We set a goal for January 1st, new year, new me, new body, new success and wealth and happiness. But like, why don't we just do that now? The day you decide to set a resolution for the new year, why doesn't that make that that day? Why isn't that your new year? You know, tomorrow is not guaranteed and we don't know how we're going to be tomorrow. And better yet, also take inventory of the past goals and resolutions that you've made. Maybe you wanted to lose 30 pounds last year, but you didn't. And it's okay, you lost 10. Hey, maybe this year you lose the other 20 that you wanted to lose. So just check out this clip where we kind of talk about this subject and living for the now and making the decisions now and what it takes to do that. I don't know a single person who walked into a gym and worked out, got a good sweat on, and walked out feeling worse than when they walked in. It's like magic. Facts. You know what I'm saying? It's, it is like magic. Like us, it is like everybody talks about that like magic pill, this quick fix, the switch that they wish they had. That's it. You know? That choice is that pill. Yeah. There's no red or blue pill. That's it. So we're coming up on the holidays. We're coming up on New Year's. We were talking about a little bit earlier how New Year's resolutions really like drive me bananas. I feel like when we choose a resolution, we're actually choosing in most cases and I'm only observing from my experiences, setting ourselves up to fail. And that's because we're going from zero to 100. And in the holidays, I feel like if you're starting to think about the end of the year, and creating good habits, like, oh, in January 1st, I'm going to start this. Well, why not now? Today is someday. Let's start that now. So, dude, let's wake up one hour earlier. That's that one habit. Like, I love that. I used to tell people, start journaling what you're eating. And if they would do it for two weeks, because I used to do personal training and stuff way before I became what I am now. If they actually did it for the two weeks and then showed me the journal, I would take them on as a client. But mm-hmm. if they didn't even do it or start it, I'm like, you're not going to be a client. And I wouldn't, that was my first parameter to say, what well, am I going to spend time with you? Because it's a relationship and the psycho. I mean, I was basically their therapist more than anything else. Mm-hmm. It's a great, it's, it's, you know, definitely a relevant topic to talk about. I don't believe in a new year's resolution. I think, I mean, I just said you can't be, the best version of yourself tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You just physically can. It's impossible. Yeah. So thinking about being the best version of yourself in two months is even, is even further out of the, of the mix. Or choosing to be on the first, right? Yeah. Right. Like I, it, the way I see it is everybody wants to be rich. I mean, maybe not everybody, but most people do, you know? Mm-hmm. You're not going to say, I want to be rich on the first. <laughs> I want to start being rich exactly. on the first. You can't You're like, start. no, 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 I'm going to go. Uh, like if, I, if that's a goal of mine, today I start. I start trying to figure out how to make it work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're not like, oh, I'm going to stop being broke today. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start putting the pieces together. And so the New Year's resolution is like, I'm going to stop smoking on New Year's or I'm going to stop eating sugar. I'm going to I'm going to stop, you know, I'm going to start going to the gym. I kind of look at it. I go always back to this thing. We're guaranteed a day. What happens if if, if by the first, you know, something catastrophic happens? Mm -hmm. Like, why would you wait to do something that's going to make you the best possible version of yourself why would you wait two months like and you're not guaranteed that you might not wake up a month from now tomorrow you might you know i mean Mm -hmm. i I don't i don't walk around feeling that way but i do know that i am guaranteed this time yeah today and if there's something that i want to do if i'm not doing it now 
I run the risk of never being able to do it. Dude, just start now. Today is someday. Today is that day. Today's your new year if you say it is. Why does it have to be January 1st? It doesn't. It has to be the day you decide it to be. So, you know, I want you all to smash your goals, accomplish your goals, do everything you set out to do. And, you know, if you fall a little bit short, it's cool. Let's not beat ourselves up, you know, talking to myself here. But realize that did we move forward? That's a win. Now let's keep stacking those wins. Let's keep the momentum going. Start now. So as a creator, let's say you're an entrepreneur, let's say you're a parent, a friend, you know, whatever it is, there is, there's moments of doubts that creep in, right? And uh, sometimes we get to the point of giving up and we either give up too soon or we let it linger on enough to realize, that, ooh, we almost gave up and, and it wasn't the right thing to do. And it could lead you to finding your voice. It could lead you to finding your purpose. And ultimately, everyone goes on their own journey. And this is just a cool example of never giving up, right? And honestly, no one's an overnight success. She's been doing this for years. And until recently, people know who she is. And it's not for a lack of talent or anything, but good thing she didn't give up. Check it out. I remember, I want to say it was in 2018 when I was really at my low point. And I was really ready to give up music. I was ready to let it go. I was, I, I, I was done. And I remember we were here in LA, I was visiting. And I asked him, I said, why do you think country music isn't working for me? And and the conversation we had, like he challenged me. He says, you've been pursuing country music this whole time. And all you were doing was trying to sing someone else's story and someone mm. else's truth. And you need to write your truth and stop running away from everything that makes you different. And those words in that moment changed everything for me. Wow. Everything in a, uh, I went from like having no idea how to write. And before we even started this, you said writer's block. I had like a five year writer's block where I had no idea what I was singing, what I wanted to sing. And when he told me that, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't go to sleep at night because I had so many ideas and I'm just typing them in my phone, like just writing everything down that I could possibly, that was just coming out of my brain because I was just being me. Yeah. You know, and after watching that and hearing her story and just, I like to take inventory and take stock of my experiences and what I've done and how many times I've almost given up on something. And you know, on the other side, how many times I should have gave up on something much sooner and not dragged it on. Um, so it can play light into that as well. So just realize like you're probably on the right path and you're on the verge of that next thing, that next breakthrough, hitting the other side and just finding your stride. So keep going. So what does success look like for you? That's it. That's the question. How do you define it? How do you see it apply to your life? Check out this clip with Ivana telling us just this amazing little story that may give you the same reaction I had. I wanted to have time for me. Um, you know, there, and there, there's a story about a fisherman. I don't know if you've heard it. Have you heard it? No, story no. about a fisherman. And this story represented everything for me this moment. It's a very short story. But basically, there's this fisherman um, <laughs> that is, you know, laying in a hammock at 1 p.m. in wherever town he's in. And the mayor of the town comes by and he sees him and he's like, what are you doing? Why are you sleeping? And he goes, oh, well, I, I went in the morning. I fished. I'm done. He's like, but what do you mean? It's 1 p.m. You still have like a good three, four hours of like good fishing. Why aren't you out there? He's like, well, I caught some fish. I came back. I sold some fish. I ate some fish. Like, I'm good. It's like, but you can still fish more. And he's like, for what? Well, then if you fish more, you can sell more. He's like, and then what? Well, then you can, you know, make more money. And, and he's like, and then he's like, maybe you can buy more boats and have a fleet of boats. And then you can buy, have a team and have a whole company about fishing. He's like, and then what? Well, then one day maybe you can retire and sell your company and, and enjoy your days. Mm -hmm. He's like, kind of like how I'm doing now. 
<laughs> you know, so yeah, that to me was like, yes, like I, I, I don't want to be on this like eternal, like pursuit of success without even having defined what success means for you. Um, I think that that is a lot of how older generations were were functioning, and and I want to believe at least that there is some form of awakening happening right now where people are understanding that success and happiness and, and the value of things are, 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 are not that anymore. So I'll tell you how I defined success, you know, especially in my early 20s. Lots of money, diamonds on my watch, nice rims, clothing, the houses, the parting, the things, right? I believe success was the American dream. You had to have X, Y, and Z to look successful, to feel successful. But on the inside, I didn't feel any of those things. It stroked my ego. It was a beautiful thing for my ego. But when I lost it all, I realized, wait a minute, does that mean I'm not successful? Why am I still here? It's still me. I don't have these things. So it, it was one of the, the, the stories in my life where money defined who and what I was until it didn't because I didn't have an option and I got to start over and get that perspective and get that rude awakening. And ultimately success is what I deem it is, you know? And the other lesson here is comparison. You know, as an artist, I'm like, well, I want to be like that artist. or I want to be as famous as that artist. or I want my art to sell like that, right? As musicians, as mothers, as fathers, whatever it is that we're doing, let's try to stop comparing ourselves to others and live our lives because before you know it, you're going to be at that level. And someone behind you is going to say, hey, why don't I be like him or her? Oh, this one's a doozy, right? Uh, I like to say that a few of us operate from a few different fears. One, the fear of losing, right? The fear of success is the second one. Or the third one, the fear of what do people think about us? And that one resonates with me more than ever. It's definitely a battle that I've, I've gone through. But it's like, why do we care so much about what people think of us? You know, and there's a million and one reasons why that matters. But imagine not letting it impact us as much as it impacts us. You know, I've had my day ruined for me wallowing in these thoughts. Uh, check out this clip. We're all human. And guess what? Why are we caring what X, Y, and Z thinks about us? That's another issue that we have that's as humans. definitely an issue though. Yeah, that's like the biggest human. Yeah. Like this fear of being judged by the outside world. Look, I always say, if they ain't paying my bills and loving me or taking care of me in a different type of way to build me spiritually, I don't care about X, Y, or Z's opinion at all. I'm taking that sound bite and I'm putting my headphones and just put it on repeat. <laughs> yes, it's true though. But it's, it's so natural for us to get caught up. We live in a world where we're like scrutinized every day, social mm -hmm. media, everything is just so like on you 24 seven. You know, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has something to say. They have access to you. Everyone has access to you. So yeah. how do you build that armor? That's a great question. I've been told by a couple of different people, just doing powwows and like coaching conversations yeah. and thing. And someone's like, they actually just told me like, Ruben, you should be less available. Mm. And I, I just sat there and it landed for a moment because I reply to every comment. Mm. I, I reply to the DMs. Like I'm engaged in the yes. community, the audience that I'm trying to build. But at the same time, I can see now you can be too available and too it, and it takes away from you. Yes. And you can't replenish yourself. Yes. Now that's another conversation. That's all about the glass being full. Because mm -hmm. your glass has to be full to do all this beautiful work. Mm -hmm. And if you're pouring all day long to each comment, yo, that's taking your energy. Mm -hmm. That's like taking all that water and you're going like this. So when you get to the studio, you're like on E, dude. When you want to go play with Remy, you're on E. I know. So I'm glad that whoever told you that, told you that. Mm -hmm. You're unavailable for a reason. It's because you have... A glass that needs to stay full. You have a family. You have this beautiful brand that you're building. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm so glad somebody told you that. It makes me happy. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's easier said than done, right? But we as long as we keep remembering this, you know, keep remembering this. And you know, people are gonna say what they're gonna say. 
So I think that the best reframe for this is like, let's be gentle to ourselves and control how we are viewing and judging ourselves because we can't control how other people view and judge us. And it doesn't matter. Let them view and judge us the way they do. Now, if there's something you can take responsibility in showing up differently, again, then that does fall on you. But it starts with how you judge yourself on the inside. So what are you telling yourself? Being right versus taking responsibility. Oof, I know I struggle with wanting to be right. I don't know why. I'm just wired that way. It's what, it's my upbringing. It's where I've been and I'm trying to work on it. I'm really trying to work on it. But I also am fiercely of the mindset of taking responsibility. And in this clip, Chris Lee tees up the fact that taking responsibility doesn't make you wrong. And it was like, you know that emoji? This was an aha moment for me. So you can take responsibility. It has nothing to do with being right or wrong. So that whole conversation or trigger doesn't have to be affected. So just realize what happens when we come from that position of power and say, hey, I'm taking responsibility for this moment. Check it out. There's this talk about toxic positivity now. Right, you hear it all over social media. Oh my God, you must have been in the training room with me yesterday. Okay. I literally took somebody on about that. That's so great. Oh my God, Ruben, we're connected. Perfect. So, <laughs> so like, like that's running around. That's like a thing now. Like, talk about what you talked about yesterday. Though. Well, I, I had a guy in a training room that, no matter. You know, if you were, if you've been in my trainings, you know that there's a whole piece of it where you get feedback mm -hmm. about how you're showing up and what you're putting across. And so there's feedback about what's working and feedback about what's not working. And so the first part of the training, of course, is feedback about what's not working. And this guy kept laughing at the feedback, like ah. You know, and people are going, my experience of you is shut down and angry, and he's like laughing. And I go, excuse me, sir, how are you hearing the feedback? Because it seems like you're just laughing it off. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, I'm positive. I'm like, well, there's a difference between having a mindset of positivity and toxic positivity. Mm. Toxic positivity is when all you're willing to see are the things that are positive and you're not willing to see what's not working or seeing what's in the way. And the problem with that is, A, there's no growth. Mm -hmm. And B, you're in denial. And finally, the indefinition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. How are you going to grow if you're not willing to acknowledge what isn't working or what's in the gap? Mm. So toxic positivity is having a belief that everything is great. And how's your marriage? Amazing. Meanwhile, she's moving out. Mm. How's your health? Great. Meanwhile, your cholesterol has closed off all your arteries. Mm. How is your business? Amazing. Meanwhile, you're bankrupt. And so toxic positivity is about denial. And so to me, I don't even like the word positive. Like positive is a judgment. Mm -hmm. Positive, negative. It's not about positive or negative. It's about what works, what doesn't work. Mm. And so when I identify what works, I'm able to see what I get to duplicate. I get to see what is valuable, what I get to continue to do. By seeing what's not working, I'm able to see what I get to interrupt, what I get to shift, what I get to change. Mm. Because one of the biggest problems I see is people, a lot of times, will address a breakdown but they won't change anything. It's almost like, yeah, I know we're in a breakdown, but it's you or it's the circumstance. Until you take personal responsibility for your life and your results, nothing will ever be different. You could be positive till the cows come home, but it's not gonna change the reality of identifying this is what I get to take responsibility for. Mm. I think positive, uh, Toxic positivity can become a major problem because we're not willing to see the signs. It's almost like listening for what you want to listen for. So, you know, you have a client and they're like, yeah, 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 I'm in. 
and you're so excited about them being in, you're not hearing the listening to the listening. Mm. Like what's behind what he's saying? Is he saying or she saying or they saying something to get off the hook from being around me mm -hmm. or to please me or are they authentically committed? Yeah. If I'm in toxic positivity, I'll be like, yeah, they're a yes. And then they don't show up. And I'm pissed that they didn't show up. Meanwhile, I'm the problem mm. because I didn't listen. I didn't connect to what was going on. You know, and sometimes if you don't listen to words and the meaning behind what people are saying, you're missing the message. This was just a moment for me. I really had a moment because it's not about taking blame. It's not about being wrong. That's where most of our bottleneck is. Trust me, I know. But it's just about taking responsibility. Take responsibility for the moment, for the action. Then start unpacking the rest. That was an aha moment for you. This next section, um, when I had the conversation, um, I couldn't relate as much to parts of the conversation. But now in the aftermath, and I'll share that after you watch the clip, like th there's just parts of it that land a little bit more. And just realizing, again, we need to take care of ourselves. And, and what is, what is self-love and how does that feed everything else? Check it out. She's like, what's more expensive? You being sick 50 years from now or are you buying the grass-fed beef now? Yeah, nah, I'm mean, being sick 50 years from now because what you were saying is I want to play with my grandkids. That's part of one of the pillars of my fitness. The six pack is a byproduct. Yeah. It's a happy accident. I love it. It's great. But that's not why I do it. If that's why I did it, I'd, there'd be unhealthier ways for me to do yeah. what I did. But I also want to live to 125. And when I was in finance, we are living older. We are living longer. And long-term care costs and the system isn't built for us. Absolutely. It's really expensive. And if you don't have $10 million for your health journey, once you hit retirement, yeah. it's going to be really bad. Take advantage now. And I really hope that that message lands with your viewers today. It wasn't the diet that helped me lose 45 pounds. Yeah. It wasn't the living on the ashram that helped me lose the 45 pounds mm -hmm. and get off medication and heal my heart. It was the ultimate act of self-love and making the decisions that were gonna fuel my health, fuel my happiness, fuel my sense of purpose, honoring my constitution, mm -hmm. turning down the noise on what I thought I should be doing and listening to what my heart actually wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the weight loss was a byproduct. My mental health and happiness was was a byproduct. Mm -hmm. Another time that that was introduced into my life was when I got pregnant. So I miscarried twins the first time that I got pregnant, mm. which was like fucking awful. Can't imagine. Something else that, you know, a lot of doctors will say, oh, it's, it's, it's so common, right? It's so common. It's normal. Just get over it. It's not, right? It's not, it might be common, but it's not normal. Mm -hmm. So when I got pregnant with my son, it was another opportunity. I was so terrified of miscarrying again that I remembered everything from the ashram. What do I need to be doing that I've like let off the hook? I need to sit in stillness every day. Mm. I need to practice gratitude for my body. This heart that has beat for me since before I even arrived in this planet, yeah. right? Or in this earth. Mm -hmm. um, and just turn things around. And it was when I was 34 years old that I can say that I actually learned to love myself because mm. I had to in order to not have a miscarriage. Like, isn't that screwed up? totally screwed up. Um, but that's exactly what happened. And I think a lot of women will just like, they'll ask themselves, what is wrong with me? Why isn't this working for me? Why am I not losing weight? Why don't mm -hmm. I feel good? Mm -hmm. And often it's because it's comparison or it's advice that's coming from a doctor who doesn't know about functional medicine, or it's coming from a male doctor, which I hate to say, but a lot of us women are taking advice from men who will never understand. We love you, men. We love you, but you will never understand our physiology. I don't understand male OBGYNs. You don't have the gear. Like you're yeah. not like how in my head, I just, I can't wrap my, I would never go study that as medicine. I'm like I'm not a woman and the woman is more complicated than anything. I think you guys are superheroes. And I always say this and kudos to you, my wife and everyone else. If, if reproduction was left up to me as a man, like we'd be extinct. Yeah. Like I can't do it. <laughs> right. And, and the stresses that you're talking about, 
I remember my wife going through pregnancy and she put so much weight and stress on herself. Like if anything is wrong with my baby, this is on me, right? Yeah. She didn't think, oh, Ruben, you played a role with some of your genetic. No, it was her. I'm the oven. I'm the cook. I'm carrying this. I'm delivering this. Like, and it was just the stress. Pregnancy was a delight. She didn't have yeah. any issues. But that mental conversation was huge for her. And yeah. I didn't know how to deal with that. And I'm, I obviously don't have the tools yeah. or the yeah. physical tools to relate to it. Obviously, I could hold space and support. But that conversation is huge. Oh my gosh. Yeah. With all this like birth control controversy that's coming out now, my husband said to me the other day, he's like, you'd really trust men to be on a birth control? You trust men to take a pill every day? And I'm like, oh, noted. Okay. Good point. But the point is of that, and even with your wife going through that experience, which most women do, um, what if the lesson didn't have to come with getting pregnant? What if that was part of what we teach our daughters, our mm. women, our boys even, right? This profound respect that you are a walking, talking miracle. You have an ecosystem of bugs and bacteria and parasites mm -hmm. and everything within you. You have an ecosystem that's living within it's you. so fascinating. Right? So can we not honor that and help them make more educated choices around self-love and, oh, my son knows. It's not good food, bad food. It's, oh, mommy, when I eat that, I'm going to have more energy. When I eat that, it's going to taste pretty freaking good, but I'm my belly's going to hurt after. Right? I love that. So it's really shifting now because I'm really cautious, especially for my daughter. It's like, oh no, that's that's bad. That's good. That's bad. It's just understanding. No, no, no. Which one's going to bring you more self-love? Which one mm. is made for your body? This one vessel, the only vessel that you will get mm. in this lifetime. What's going to make you feel better long-term and how to take ownership in those decisions versus not. Then the work gets a lot easier as we get older, right? I talk about self-love a lot and, and like it's thrown out a lot more now. Like it's gotten popular and it's a good thing that it's gotten popular. But, you know, we start off this section with it wasn't the exercise or the food or the things that made Mona lose the weight. It was the act of self-love. It was the act of loving herself, you know. And then recently she she actually shared about the miscarriage of her twins. And recently my wife and I had a miscarriage what well, she did but that's another conversation like how as men do we show up and and carry the space is also being a part of it um and and i was there and it was devastating but at the same time we got through it and, and it's the act of self-love you know we had a, we have our beautiful child remy who also helped a lot and took the sting out of it but as men, and I'm talking to the men now, we just got to hold space. We got to be empathetic. We got to be compassionate. And to show up that way, we get to choose self-love for ourselves to be able to do that for our partners when we go through these situations or in anything that's happening. So, yeah. Thank you. You're probably saying, Ruben, Ruben, I get it. I hear you. Use love as fuel. Um you know, make the choices, make the change, make the answers happen. But how do I get the outcome? How do I get the outcome? Check out this clip with Humble about being entitled to the work. We have to be mindful of how we let, we, 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 we worthy. Like even the idea of balance, you have to find a balance. It's like, where do we see actual balance? Somebody on a, on a, on a thin wire, mm -hmm. do they achieve balance once and now it's, now it's forever? Nope. No, it's a constant, and it's constant energy, it's constant activating your core. Mm -hmm. That's what life is, that's what love is. So what I realize is it's constant, it's constant service, it's constant, it's, it's what you did yesterday, or I think, I think it's the idea from the Bhagavad Gita, you are only entitled to the labor. Mm not the outcome. And for, as I said, love is the verb, love is the work. Yeah. And you are only entitled to the work. Uh, you are only entitled to the rainbow. Not the, whether the pot of gold comes is a whole different story. Yeah. And um, to live in life through love for me is that work. And it's endless. And the measurement of, 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 of it is progress, not perfection. Nothing will ever be perfect. But we can easily measure progress. Are we doing better today or last week or last year than we are mm -hmm. now? That's the important question that we should ask.
Well, there you have it. That's what we can control. We can control the work. We can control the effort. We can control what we're doing, but we cannot control the outcome. That outcome's going to come. So just let it happen. Do what you have the power to do. And most importantly, enjoy the journey. That's really what matters. So when we think about health and wellness and biohacking and all these fun things around the human body, what do we think about? Protein powders, vitamins, supplements, the next diet, the next training protocol. But imagine if we already had one of the access to one of the greatest biohacks around. And that's using kindness. Check out what Darren says here on this clip. How do I define living a life through love? The first word that pops in my head is surrender, because I think we are that. And so something I need to work on all the time is, is surrendering to our true nature mm. and not, a, not my idea mm. of who I am or what I am or what I need to do. It's kind of like, I mean, I'm even a little, I can feel my ego freaking out even now. Right. Because it's like, am I love and am I loved by not doing or being anything? Mm. And just now actually asking myself that question, it's like, oh, wow, I might have some things tied to that because we think we need to do all these things. So, um, so for me, it's, it's surrender to my nature, which doesn't allow the ego to come. And just by you being you and me being me and being having a, a, a soul that gets to travel in this body, I think that's it. Mm. And we get to have some experiences and contribute here and there, but surrendering to what really love is, which is us. Kindness. That's it. Kindness. It's the greatest biohack, right? Just like love. Imagine if we just run around and be kind all day and re-energize ourselves. Kind of like a really nice long hug releasing that oxytocin, that feel good. You know, the better we feel, the better we're going to show up. Be kind. So in this clip, I have my friend Officer McGee on. You know, I call him Scott. But uh, it's real interesting, you know, what he sees in the world and his experience and the experience we all have around police officers nowadays with, with so much going on in the news. This clip really landed for me because out of all his training, gun work, skill work, I mean, he's a SWAT officer too. Out of all that, like he knows how to take you down with his pinky. You know what he says his greatest weapon is? Check it out. You could hear the stuff on the radio just like throughout the day. You could hear like someone just got stabbed. There are shootings happening. There's structure fires. There's lootings. And this was just nonstop. Which is hard, especially coming like that happening in like the city that um, you grew up in. Mm -hmm. And having this and having it, I always felt like I was like, man, there's like this. There's uh, we, there's a shared humanity here that we're missing. Mm. And because we are not really communicating well with each other. And, and law enforcement in general is not that good at communicating why we do things. Yeah. Or um, really ex explaining when we make a mistake. There's I mean, that happens in the medical field, um, happens in dentistry you know it's like happens wherever there's human beings there's going to be mistakes yeah some more egregious than others but anyway so this goes and there's uh tons of protests everywhere um at that particular time there's a protest uh south of me that grew 
and that grew into uh, some dispersal orders and then uh, some tools were being used at that time, like less lethal tools. And I think some, some like, uh, crowd management tear gas types of things. I was not there on that side. I was on the other side and there was a, a group gathering there. And initially I'd respond to the other side because we didn't want our cars to be damaged and taken over, which we had seen the day before. And in these particular cars, there was a whole, all kinds of stuff in there that we did not want, did not want, uh, taken. So I went to the other side. Anyways, the group started building up and it got so big. I remember one point they're like, you want us to box you in? Fine. We're going to box you in like hundreds of people. And I remember looking, just looking back and like, yep, we're boxed in. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, uh, like don't change it other than that. I, I, we don't want to fight. Yeah. You know, this is, or are we just going to start punching each other? Like, this is not something that at least I was not interested in at all. And so as the crowd grew and grew and grew, it started feeling like to the point where um, it was going to go that way. And what you saw on video, I was in um, all of my SWAT gear and had my helmet. I had my gas mask on because I was going back and forth on the other side. Mm -hmm. I had it also on because of COVID and I was around hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. And covered in head to toe in my uniform. And the other person that was leading that group that was about like, you know, as you see, like five to seven yards in front of us mm -hmm. was somebody I knew. Not only did I know, but that guy, I grew up in an apartment building and the neighbors uh, next to us had been in that apartment building since the 60s, like my family had mm -hmm. right next door. And that was their grandson. And so he was also my mom's caretaker. Mm. He used to take care of my mom on her worst days, multiple times, three in the morning. He checked on her. He fed her cats. Like he just was an amazing soul. And I really, owed, like when I saw him, it was an immediate like, oh, we can fix this. Mm. And so I immediately like just walked, was like drawn to him. There was no like tactical planning going on at that point. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, okay, uh, you know, let me notify command what's going on. Let me notify my team. It was just like, it was just a dr draw. And then you could see me uh, tapping him and I was telling him to, um, to look at me, look in my eyes and tell him, say, hey, look, it's me. It's Scott. Look at me. Look at me. Because he was really angry. Yeah. Look at me. And once you can see in there, once he, once he does, because he couldn't recognize me. And once he did. That's when like some of the air came out and we hugged. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea about the cameras, no clue, like no clue. That was not at all like on my radar whatsoever. And so once I gave him a hug, that's when like all of a sudden it was like an air, an air coming out of a balloon that was about to pop. It was just, mm -hmm. and the whole crowd dynamic changed. Um, and then we were actually able to talk. I was able to explain to them, hey, um, we got a shooting going on right now. Someone just got stabbed around the corner here. Uh, there's a structure fire at Vans. Vans is getting looted right now. I was like, you guys have us all blocked in. We can't, we can't like move our, our resources out mm -hmm. to go help people. And once I ex explained that to them, they're like, oh my gosh, okay. I was like, can you guys, can I get you guys to just move out of the street? Like, come on, come over here. Like, can you just, and they were like, cool. And then they eventually did. Um, and that whole thing happened without any single physical use of force on that side. And I tell people, I was like, hey, you know, I'm armed with more than just like yeah. my weapons here. You have to like to be, to really be like to effective, you have to be able to have a lot of different types of tools. And at that moment, love was my most effective tool. Mm. It was a moment of pure humanity that mm. cut through all the noise that then permeated into everybody. Yeah. Yeah. After that, it was, man, that was surreal. Uh, I didn't, again, didn't think about it. Didn't mean, even mean for that to happen. They started chanting my name, which was kind of strange because I was like, how do you even see me? Literally like not, you couldn't see one piece of my skin yeah. other than through my, like the, the goggles. But I realized. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, it's right, it's right here. here. Yeah. Um, 
but they were great. And I still have relationships with some of those folks. So it's not his gun, the pepper spray, the baton, the handcuffs, his jujitsu training. It's none of that. It's love. And that's it. His greatest weapon is love. My greatest weapon is love. Your greatest weapon is love. Let's weaponize that over anything else. You know, how do you teach someone self-love? Uh, this is a conversation we had. And again, I'm learning on the fly here as a new dad. And in the short time that I've been a father, everything I could teach my son is not by me telling him. I can't tell him to do things. That's different. I can show him by leading by example. And in this clip, I talk about how I can teach him self-love. And there's only one way to do it in my eyes, in my experience. This is just how I do it. You know, maybe it works for you. Check it out. You got to fill up your own cup. Yeah. One of the things I say is like with the self-love conversations, if I can't show myself to be kind and gentle with myself in those conversations and yeah. show me looking in the mirror and choosing love myself every morning... As you know, Remy's running around doing everything we're doing. He takes it all in. Yeah. So he can also take in more than we see of each other because there's no filters. There's no world that has jaded him. There's no memories. There's yeah. nothing to reference. It's just coming at him. So if he sees you loving yourself, if he sees me loving himself, he's going to know how to love himself. Yeah. But if he sees, oh, my parents love me so much, but they sacrificed everything. That means I have to do that when I'm older too, yeah. right? There's that continuing so yeah i think i you know we're not we are the blind leading the blind and the pl parenthood but i think we're doing a great job <laughs> i will pat ourselves on the back so that's it like i have to be the example i get to be the example um he does everything i do literally everything i do i catch him doing a new thing i'm like i didn't teach you that how did you even know how to do that? And some of the stuff is like, Pfft. but uh, again, you know how he's going to learn to love himself because I'm showing up loving myself. So it's just a constant reminder for me to practice the act of self-love, being gentle with myself because it it's going to translate and he's going to learn how I treat myself. He's also going to learn how I treat his mother, right? The conversations I have with her, the words that I use with her in arguments, because arguing is okay. And you can argue in front of your kids, just all these things. Just remember how you guys are showing up in relationship, how my wife and I are showing up together in relationship. My son, Remy and future children will be seeing and experiencing. It's just a little reminder. What do you do when you're trying to turn your side hustle into your real hustle? What do you do when you don't know the answer to something, right? And if you don't know the answer to something, do you just not do it? Check out this clip from Janisha. No is not an option. I would say mindset is everything mm -hmm. because when I started out, again, I started out acting first because I already came from like the print sports background. So I, was, I had a familiarity with mm -hmm set life and set work and ethics and stuff. But when I was making that transition over into the other areas, um, I was doing like background, like you could catch me doing background one day, principal the next day, like mm -hmm. that was the hustle and grind in me. And I will say this, I was meeting background people who had been doing background for like 10 years and like five years. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know what's wrong with them. Like, I don't know how you do it. I've, so I've I've done a lot of work in the space. Yes. And then there's like, there's background and the, there's levels to background. There there's is like, a, bruh, I there's a like, hierarchy, okay? I was the shirtless guy that got paid a lot to say <laughs> nothing but stand yeah. there sometimes. I'm like, this is really weird. Yeah, there's like featured background, uh -huh. you know, and it's like the background is always next to main talent. And I'm just like, I said, God, I'm not doing background for no 10 years, five years. I'm not doing it for a year. I'm giving you three months. I, this is a conversation I have got. I'm giving you three months to mm -hmm. get me in this union. I was in the union in three months. I literally was Taft Hartley two months into my career doing a Gatorade commercial that mm -hmm. was directed by Joe Pitka. Yeah. And um, yeah, so 
I would say it's really mindset because those people that I talked mm -hmm. to who were doing background for their entire lives didn't seem like they had any ambition to do anything else. And if they did, they weren't driven enough mm -hmm. or motivated enough to make things happen, kind of just going with the flow. And you see that in life. It's oh, like, yeah. you know, people that don't hustle, don't grind, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, look, if this is a race, bro, you about to lose because you are not putting your right in front of the left. You're just kind of standing there. Yeah, you could be an athlete or a spectator and there's a lot Pretty of Pretty much. And there's a lot of spectators, a lot of spectators mm -hmm. and a lot of spectators who talk too. That's yeah. The worst. <laughs> so yeah, um, you're lucky, or you're this, or someone. Yeah, it's the like door this ain't you. luck, yeah. bro. This is <laughs> this is not luck. This is doing the work. This yeah. is the hustle, the grind. You know, I don't sleep. I don't get enough. I don't get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I will sleep in my grave. I tell you that. Yeah, and when I do sleep, I sleep well at night. You know, mm -hmm. comfortable. <laughs> Very comfortable. Accomplished. Accomplished. The secret is there is no secret, right? Be a student of the sport, of what you're doing, both on and off the field. Put in the work, put in the effort when the eyes are on or off of you. That's it. Thank you so much for watching this video, for watching part two as we conclude some of the amazing guests we've had on the show in 2022. And stay tuned because the show's only growing. It's only getting bigger. And we're going to learn how the world is showing up living through love more than we actually realize it, more than we actually know it.